We'll go ahead and talk about flight controls. Flight controls. You've got a nice control touch. You'll be able to do that. Okay. Terminal learning objective action. Describe the components, operational characteristics, functions, limitations of the CH-47D flight controls. Conditions in a classroom and given a student handout. Standards. Correctly answer in writing without reference. Six of eight questions pertaining to the components, operational characteristics, limitations, the function and functions of the CH-47D flight controls in accordance with TM 1-1520-240-10 the operator's manual, and the student handouts. Safety requirements, none. Risk assessment, low. Environmental conditions, none. And evaluation, each student will be evaluated on this block of instructions during the first written examination. This will be a criterion type examination requiring a go in each scorable unit or each scored unit. You will have 90 minutes for the exam. Any questions? All right. Learning step activity one. Describe the operational characteristics, components, and limitations of the flight controls. As we talk about the flight controls, we're going to talk about the mechanical linkage from what you do up front. And we're going to take you up to the upper dew boost actuators, and we're going to stop there. Okay? Taking you up to the upper dew boost actuators is going to take you to just below the swatch plate. And then rotor will pick up the rest of the class. Okay. On the CH-47, as we talk about the mechanical linkage, the first thing you need to realize and understand is the only thing you're doing by manipulating those flight controls is manipulating hydraulic fluid. At an excess of 2,500 pounds of rotor system, without that hydraulic fluid being moved, you couldn't manipulate those rotor systems. So even though we're going to talk about the mechanical linkage, the result is going to be the transference or the movements of hydraulic fluid. At both a integrated lower control actuator, or for, we call the ILCA for short, and then of course the upper dew boost actuators. And we'll get you to those. Looking at the flight controls, of course we're going to talk about the cockpit controls. And like any other rotary wing aircraft, the flight controls are going to go from the pilot side over to the co-pilot side. Why? Because the front controls, if you manipulate the left pedal on the pilot side, the left pedal on the co-pilot side is going to move. That's how they're rigged. Okay, so of course, and that's pretty much standard to any rotary wing aircraft, any helicopter. From there, it's going to go back to a place called the flight control closet, located between station 95 and 120. Now, as we look at the flight control closet, just to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music, if you stand underneath the forward transmission, the back of the room is the front of our helicopter. If you make a left face, your right hand is going to be station 95, which is going to be the back of your bulkhead. Your left hand will be station 120, which will be the front of the cabin. That's what the area you're talking about. That's where the flight control closet is. And there, we'll break down the pieces and parts in there as we go along. Up to the forward upper controls, to the first stage mixing complex or mixing unit, same thing. To the second stage mixing unit. And then from there, it's going to go back through the tunnel cover area through a series of bell cranks and connecting rods to the aft fuselage controls, to the aft upper controls, and also the forward swash plate and aft swash plate. So the flight controls from that second stage mixing unit is going to go forward to the upper dew boost actuators and aft to the upper dew boost actuators, which is actually going to result in the movement of hydraulic fluid that's going to result in moving the swash plate, which is going to manipulate your rotor system in response to what you're telling the aircraft to do. Mechanical linkage from the cockpit to the rotary wing assemblies, that's what we're going to talk about. Again, as pilots on the CH-47D, all the mechanical linkages are doing are is resulting in a movement of hydraulic fluid. Again, at the 
integrated lower control actuators which are actually in the flight control closet and we'll show you those and then of course those big old massive upper dew boost actuators which is going to result in the movement of the rotor blades themselves. Now as we talk about this you're going to find out that the transmissions on this aircraft are already pre-tilted forward. So when you look at the forward transmission it's mounted at a forward tilt of nine degrees. The aft transmission is mounted at a forward tilt of four degrees, resulting in a forward propulsion for ground handling, ground taxing of this aircraft. That's what you're doing. Now, that propulsive force is going to allow you to ground taxi this aircraft, but what do you think that's going to become when we go to hover this aircraft? It's going to want to go forward. So either you're going to have to pull in a lot of aft cyclic or they had to give you something that was going to compensate for that. And they did. Okay, the longitude of cyclic trim actuators, one of their functions in life, and we talked about them yesterday, is to negate that nine degree and four degree tilt of the transmission up in the rotor disc, allowing you to do hover work. If not, you would either have to pull in a lot of aft cyclic to do hover work or the aircraft's going to want to go forward. So that's why we had to negate that nine degree and four degree tilt. And so that's what it looks like when you're sitting out on the aircraft. Again, as long as this aircraft's on the ground, and later on we're going to talk about the longitude of cyclic trim actuator, one of the indications is the ground position. In the ground position, the tilt of the, or the pre-detilted of the forward and aft transmissions is what's going to be allowed to influence the rotor system for ground handling, ground taxing of this aircraft. And we'll, you'll see what I mean here in just a second. Now, the LCTs, Longitude of Cycle Trim Actuators. We talked about them yesterday in the fact that if they're not programming like they're supposed to, of course it's going to say airspeed adjust. And we talked about if they're stuck at 140 knots, what are we going to do? When it says airspeed adjust, what are you adjusting for? What did we say yesterday? You want to maintain 140 knots. Why? Because that's where they're stuck. You don't want to have to fight them until you have to fight them. And then we'll, we'll talk about that at the end of the class on emergency procedures um, and why and what you're doing to compensate for that. In the automatic mode, your advanced flight control computers are going to program those longitude cycle trim actuators for you automatically. When you first bring the aircraft to a hover, they're going to go to the retracted position, leveling off or neutralizing the rotor system, allowing you to do hover work. When you put the aircraft on the ground, they're going to go to the ground boxes that you can see on the picture here. So here's the retracted position we were just talking about. When you first pick this aircraft up, based on your aft landing gear proximity switches, and we'll talk about those in a little bit later of the class, what's going to happen is that tells those AFCS computers that, hey, aircraft's off the ground. Go ahead and retract those longitude of cycle trim actuators, and then you will see the needles go to the retracted position, allowing you to do any hover maneuvers, any hover work you need to do. When you put it on the ground, those aft landing gear proximity switches are now going to take it and take those needles back to the ground position. By going to the ground position, that's where it's going to allow the nine degree and four degree tilt of the transmission to influence those rotor systems. And then as you're flying along, as your airspeed increases, those longitude cycle trim actuators are going to start to automatically program to that airspeed. Now, we'll actually talk about how that is accomplished under advanced flight control systems class because that's the process you're going to be talking about. Right now, we just need to know that that's what we need to do. Yes, sir? Here on the picture, uh, what are the LCTs? Are those uh, the black? Uh... The LCTs are the longitude cycle trim motors right here. Okay. Good question, sir. And uh, the white uh, double? Uh... These right here yeah. are your upper dew boost actuators. Okay. That's what's actually going to result in the movement of that swash plate 
at 3,000 psi of hydraulic fluid. And we're going to actually see those in just a little bit. Very good questions. Anything else? Okay. Now, should it become necessary, we can take this switch from the automatic position to the manual position. And now what's going to happen is they're going to respond to that switch. It's going to respond to these two switches. And although you adjust them independently of each other, you don't want to take one to the full range of motion and then wait and get the other one. You want to take both of them simultaneously. The thing to keep in mind is if it's in the automatic mode, both longitudinal cycle trim actuators are in the automatic mode. If you switch it to the manual mode, now both LCTs are manual. In other words, if I have a problem with my forward LCT, when I go to manual, even though I'm manually going to program my forward LCT, I now have to program my aft LCT manually too. There's no method of just adjusting one to automatic, one to manual. It doesn't work that way. They're either both automatic or they're both manual. Any questions about that? Yes. Or yes, sir. Which hydraulic systems uh, are they moved? Is that uh, flight one or two? Or? Actually, you're going to find out. We call these the upper due boost actuators because one piston belongs to the number one flight control hydraulic system. One piston belongs to the number two flight control hydraulic system. So as long as both flight control hydraulic systems are on, each piston is going to be moving from its associated hydraulic system. Should it become necessary, if you lose a hydraulic system, one hydraulic system will manipulate the controls just fine. But that will only be in the case of an emergency. And the trims? The AFCS trims are electric via the AFCS computer. Good question. Anything else? Very good. Now, as we talked about the LCTs yesterday, they're going to provide for the following. One, by the LCTs programming the airspeed automatically, what it does, by programming the LCTs, what's going to happen now is we're going to program the tilt in the rotor discs instead of in the fuselage. Now, when you watch this aircraft take off, it takes off just like any Heller helicopter. In other words, when you start to go forward, it'll nose down just like any other aircraft. But as you start to increase your airspeed above 60 knots, what's going to start to happen is the fuselage is going to level back off, but the tilt is going to stay in the rotor system where it belongs. So thus reducing fuselage drag. As I like to say, it makes a bus as aerodynamic as a bus can be. Okay? That's what it does. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is by programming the LCTs, they're programming cyclic tilt too which is used to compensate for dissymmetry of lift and reduce blade flapping. By reducing blade flapping, it's reducing stress and strain on your vertical shafts, your rotors, and your key components. So it's reducing the stress both by reducing fuselage drag and by programming cyclic tilt, reducing blade flapping, so therefore reducing the stress. Any questions about that? As we talked about, provides longitude cycle trims, forward and aft swash plate assemblies. That's where it's going to be connected to. Forward tilt increases airspeed, minimizes or minimizes fuselage pitch attitude change. In other words, by leveling off the fuselage again, we're reducing that fuselage drag, allowing for the higher V and E's too, or the higher airspeeds. Reduces blade flapping. Reducing stress on the aft vertical shaft, fuselage angle of attack, and allow our, high, our higher V and E's. Now, when we talk about the controls, we're going to talk about the same axis that you're, or the same number of axes that you're used to, which is four. We have, just like you had before, we have the pitch axis or the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. We have the 
roll axis of the aircraft or lateral axis of the aircraft. We have the yaw axis of the aircraft, which is still controlled by the pedals, just like before. But now here's where it gets a little tricky. Instead of a collective, we have a thrust, which is one of the ones that everybody gets a little bit frustrated with because it adds an additional limitation. When you parked a helicopter in any other type, at the end of that maneuver, you just said that you simply neutralized the controls. That meant you reduced or put everything where it was supposed to be. Okay? And that was applicable to the pitch, roll, yaw, and the collective. In the CH-47, you have to say at the end of the maneuver that you neutralize the controls, thrust at the ground detent. And at first, that's all going to be new to you. So there's a little bit of a lapse of getting used to that. The thrust its own, is its own entity. And it has its own limitations that you have to be aware of. So when you land this aircraft, at the end of the maneuver, you're going to say you neutralize the controls, thrust at the ground detent. Any questions about that? Now, we're going to use ground detent a lot. We will show you how you can identify the ground detent. It won't be a, a mystery by the end of the day. Learning step activity two. Describe the components and operational characteristics of the tandem rotor. The thrust axis. When we talk about the thrust axis, this is called your thrust control. This is what it looks like right here. When you pull up the thrust control, basically what you are doing is collectively, equally, evenly, either increasing the blade angle of attack or decreasing the blade angle of attack. And this is why it gets a little funky. Because everybody says, well, if it's making a collective movement, Tom, then why don't we just call it a collective? I'm not responsible for the names. Okay? But it is making a collective movement. Meaning what? Meaning when you pull up on the thrust, it's going to collectively and evenly increase both sets of blades, causing the aircraft to increase in altitude. When you push down on the thrust, it's going to collectively and evenly on both rotor systems decrease the rotor blades, causing the aircraft to decrease in altitude. And what this will show you, the helicopter itself won't move. But it'll point up for increase, decrease the blades to decrease altitude. Now, here we go. Because the aircraft's rotor system is counter-rotating, torque is compensated for. But here's something that you have to keep in mind. And we'll talk about it as we go along. When you turn the AFCS off, there's another influence into the rotor system that's going to become a major factor. And that is that both rotor systems are equal and even in everything. Capability-wise, weight-wise, size-wise, everything is the same. So even though the rotor systems are counter-rotating, and that should counteract torque, AFCS off, this aircraft does want to flip on its side. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the yaw axis. Okay, we talked about the fact that it increases and decreases the rotor discs collectively and evenly. Vertical thrust increases the collective pitch in both rotor systems. And rotor in the opposite direction cancels torque effect. Now, the pitch axis. We told you yesterday in order to talk about the LCTs, we introduced you to a new word or new terminology associated with the tandem rotor system aircraft. And that was called differential collective pitch. Meaning what? Meaning that when you put in your forward cyclic, what's happening in the case of a forward cyclic, what's happening is your forward rotor systems 
the rotor blades are going to collectively and evenly decrease. The aft rotor blades are going to collectively and evenly increase, pushing down on the nose and pulling up on the tail, which is why this aircraft takes off just like any other aircraft initially. Until the LCT start to program, it looks just like any other aircraft. Now, differential collective pitch is going to be a term that they are going to bombard with bombard you with for a long time to come. Why? Because it's only unique to the tandem rotor system design. Again, normally when you move forward cyclic or aft cyclic, you're controlling cyclic tilt, but not in this aircraft. In this aircraft, it's called differential collective pitch. So when you put in aft cyclic, what's going to happen is your forward rotor discs are going to collectively and evenly increase. Your aft rotor discs are going to collectively and evenly decrease, pulling up on the nose, pushing down on the tail, allowing you to slow this aircraft up. Any questions about that? I mean, they call it differential thrust pitch. <laughs> Again, I don't know. I didn't have anything to do with the name. We've actually been calling it DCP or differential collective pitch for a long time. Okay, even in the predecessors, that's what it was called. And that's what it looks like for your forward longitudinal slick position or forward pitch position. Now the roll axis. This is going to give us an opportunity to talk about a couple of things. Okay? First off in the roll axis, you're talking about your cyclic control in the lateral or roll axis of the aircraft. You're talking about it moving it either left or right. Now, two things to bring up. One, when we manipulate the th cyclic left or right or the roll axis left or right, what you are doing is collectively and evenly tilting both rotor discs to the left, allowing this aircraft to either slide left or turn left in forward flight. But this is also a good time to talk about the fact that the natural tendency in this aircraft, when you first get started, is to try to over control it. And here's why. We're going to tell you that this aircraft is highly maneuverable. Okay, we showed you a video the other day showing you the British Hackaback aerobatic team and the maneuvers that they were performing. Okay, and this aircraft is highly maneuverable. The problem is, from a standstill, from a hover, when you put in left cyclic, you're going to expect the aircraft to move. And at first, she's not going to move. So what are you going to tend to do? Put in more left cyclic. And then, what's going to happen is she may start to slowly move, but that's not going to be fast enough for you. So now what are you going to do? We're going to put even more left cyclic. Once all that left cyclic kicks in, then that aircraft's going to do exactly what you told it to do, and it's going to fly as far and as fast to the left as it can. So what are you going to do? You're now going to bring it over to the right. And the tendency is, when you first get started, is to over control this aircraft. Let's think about what principles are being enacted on this aircraft. Okay, when we're sitting at a standstill, you've got a lot of aircraft to get into motion. But it's like a boat. Once it's in motion, it'll stay in motion. But the problem is you've got to be a little bit patient with it. The same things you learned in any other aircraft as far as control movement, control input, applies to this aircraft, believe it or not. You just got to be patient initially. Once that aircraft gets into motion, It'll move just fine. Any questions about that? Later on, we'll show you some tricks to prevent you from over controlling or attempting to over control this aircraft and some advantages that are built into the flight controls to help you with that. Any questions? Is there any like lead or lag time difference because the forward rotor disc is lower than the upper than the rear? Because of you know the arm away from the centrifugal force? Is it not initially. 
once it's in motion, it'll still react. No harm, no foul. I mean, you'll be, you'll be impressed how maneuverable the CH-47 is. Despite her size, despite the look, and, and my Apache drivers get upset with me. I'm the first one to admit it. But in my opinion, this is as maneuverable as any aircraft in the Army inventory. She may not look like it, but once she moves, I'm promising you she'll dance with the best of them. Okay? She likes to fly, and she likes to move. And I'll tell you right now, I haven't seen us not be able to do any maneuvers. And that's why, although the British demonstration team does a lot of maneuvers that we're not allowed to do, it's nice to know that if you needed to, it does have that ability. Any questions about that? So for the lateral axis, again, if we go to the left, it'll tilt both rotor disks to the left. If we go to the right, it will tilt both rotor disks to the right, allowing it to slide left or slide right from a hover or in the turn process, allow you to keep it in trim as you make a turn. But if I do this on ground, without giving any slight thrust, won't it potentially flip over? Um, it would take a lot to get into dynamic rollover. Actually, we're going to find out um, later on, we're supposed to talk about the limitations. You're going to find out that the ground control limitations for the rotor system, while you're sitting on the ground with the rotor blades turning, you're not allowed to move that cyclic more than one inch of lateral. What will happen is if you get into that one inch, you'll get into what's called droop stop pounding first. Now, if you can tolerate droop stop pounding and keep going to the left, then yes, this aircraft will roll over just like anything. Okay, But you would have to be willing to get into a real bad droop stop pounding before you put it on its side. Okay, and that's when we get into the ground control limitations. We'll talk more about that. Good question. Anything else? Now, the yaw axis, just like anything else, the yaw axis is going to be associated with your pedals. But now, what's going to happen, we've got to look at this from two perspectives. One, when you put in left pedal or right pedal, what exactly is encountered? And two, what it's going to do for you in, as a, at a hover. Okay, so you're going to actually see this twice. When you put in left pedal, just like any other aircraft, when you put in left pedal, the nose of the aircraft is going to go which direction? Left. left. Okay, so now, in order to move the nose to the left, what's going to have to happen up in the rotor disks? That forward rotor disk is going to have to tilt to the left, right? But as a result of tilting that disc to the left, what's going to happen to the aft rotor disc? It's going to tilt to the right, essentially allowing you to do a hover turn around that midsection or that center cargo hook. Okay? And the rule of thumb is you're going to find out as we go through this class what is applicable to the Black Hawk is applicable to this aircraft. What's applicable to the TA 67 is applicable to this aircraft. So you're not learning new concepts. All the, the only thing you're learning different is how is the maneuver or the man movement actually created via this rotor system being a tandem design. That's all, you're, that's all you're really learning. Okay. When you put in a left pedal in any other aircraft, the nose went to the left, allowing you to pivot around what portion of the aircraft? The center portion of the aircraft. Agreed? Same thing here, but the only thing is, because our, both our rotors are on top, both rotor discs had to do something to allow that to happen. And that's why when you put in left pedal, the forward rotor system is going to tilt to the left, taking the nose to the left. That aft rotor disc is going to tilt to the right, and it's going to pivot around the center of the aircraft just like anything else. Now. What you are going to find out on this aircraft, though, gentlemen, is when you bring this aircraft up to a hover, 
as long as the advanced flight control system is on, you do not need pedals in this aircraft. So guess what one of the first tendencies you're going to have to get rid of is? Kicking that left pedal. Okay, you do that in this aircraft, you're going to bring that aircraft to a hover very, very ugly. And I mean, it will dance. It will spin around on you real bad. Okay, now, why don't you need pedals? It's associated with the AFCS, and we have a wonderful feature called heading hold. Meaning what? Meaning it's connected to your directional gyro, and basically what's going to happen is through the AFCS computers, it's going to maintain the heading that you pick the aircraft up at for you. Okay? Now, AFCS off, off wise, then it you do have to make sure that you stay ahead of it. Not because of a tail rotor, not because of that tendency, but what happens is even though both our rotor systems are counter-rotating, which should counteract torque, what you have going on in the rotor system, and I like to explain it using rank, okay? And since the captain's the highest rank I have in here right now, we're going to use the captain. Okay, If I took two captains and I put them in the front of this aircraft, they're equal in time and grade, they're equal in time and service, they're equal in capabilities. If I put them up in the, in the nose or the front of this aircraft and we encounter an emergency, what's going to happen? Both those captains are going to want to take charge, right? That's what they're trained to do. Well, guess what? Same thing's going to happen up in our rotor system. Both our rotor discs, both our rotor systems are equal in every shape, form, or fashion. So what's going to happen is this aircraft's one that flips on its side. So AFCS off, you do have to stay on top of it. Not because of torque as much as a tendency of both rotor systems wanting to take charge up there. And if you're not knowledgeable that it's going to do that, it will get the best of you pretty quick. So you have to keep that in mind. And again, this is just going to show you with left pedal, forward rotor disc going to tilt to the left, after rotor disc going to tilt to the right, allowing you to do hover turns around the center cargo hook. And we already talked about what will happen with the AFCS off. Any questions about that? Now we're going to talk about hover turns. Now, here's what I like to do with hover turns. We can move slides and it'll show you everything, but what I like to do is use my hands. And we'll talk about what's going to happen. And what you're going to find out is the same requirements you had in any other aircraft you're coming from is the same requirements you have in this aircraft. The only thing that's different is how is the action actually being accomplished. So what do we mean by that? Okay. And in order to do hover turns around the front of this aircraft or the back of the aircraft, it's going to be a combination of inputs. Agreed? That's what it took in any other aircraft you were flying, and that's what it takes in this one. What combination inputs? Pedals and cyclic. And what you have is pedals and cyclic in the same direction, or you have pedals and cyclics in the opposite direction in order to you, allow you to do hover turns around either the forward rotor system or the aft rotor system. So here's what I like to do. In using my hands, I start off with what we know. Okay? It's a combination of pedal movements and cyclic movements, so let's go ahead and do my pedal movements first. Okay, so my left hand is my forward rotor system, my right hand is my aft rotor system. If I put in left pedal, I know the nose of the aircraft is going to go around the left, so what's going to happen? My forward rotor system is going to tilt to the left. My aft rotor system is going to tilt to the right. Agree? 
Now we said it's a combination of cyclic input and pedal input. So what we're going to do with the cyclic right now is we're going to take it to the same direction. So we're going to take cyclic to the left. Now, what did we say cyclic to the left did to the rotor system? It takes both rotor disks and tilt them to the left, right? So let's look at what's going to happen as a result of that. The forward rotor system is already going to be tilted left, so all it's going to do is increase to the left. But now the aft rotor disk is tilted to right, it tilts to the left, and now look what's happening. It's leveling off, allowing me to pivot around the aft rotor system, nose to the left. And that was pedals and cyclic in the same direction. Any questions about that? Now, if I can figure it out in one direction, I can figure it out in the other direction. Agreed? Any questions about that? Okay, so now let's do the other one. We got pedals and cyclic in the opposite direction. Where am I going to start? Just like before, I'm going to start with what? Left pedal. Why? Because that I know it's going to tilt, take the nose of the aircraft in the direction of the pedal, so therefore that's what it's going to look like. Now, we took left pedal, so this time we're going to talk about right cyclic. Right cyclic would normally take both rotor systems and do it what with it? Tilt it to the right. So now let's look at what happens. That forward rotor system was tilted to the left. If we move it to the right, now it's going to level off. The aft rotor system is already tilted to the right, so it's going to increase. And now it's just going to take the back of the aircraft around the forward rotor system to the right. Is that different than anything you've already learned? Nope. The only thing that's different it's how the actual maneuver is accomplished. That's the only thing that's different. Now, there's something else you need to be aware of. When you pivot around the aft rotor system, who is the body in motion? You are. The cockpit is, right? You can imagine if you're the body in motion, you're going to control that really, really well. You're not going to let that cockpit assembly or that cockpit area flip around faster than you feel comfortable, agreed? So what do you think the tendency is? When it comes to pivoting around that forward rotor system, what is now the body in motion? The flight engineer. The flight engineer or the back of the aircraft. So what do you think the natural tendency is? Since you're not moving, it's really easy to forget how fast that back end turns around. And you can have enough force back there to sling things out either cargo or passengers. That would be very ugly. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at what we just talked about. We're talking about hover turns. And there's your right pedal. And this is the other reason why I do it to the left because my training material does it the opposite way. Cyclic to the left. And now what's going to happen as a result of that is the aft rotor system is going to tilt to the left. Forward rotor system is going to level off. Why? Because we have pedals and cyclic in the opposite direction. Didn't we already say that? All we did different was this is showing to, to you in picture form. And I just like to use my hands. That's easier to, I can do that anywhere as I'm thinking about it. And again, the nose of the aircraft will always move in the direction of the pedal. Hover turns continued. Okay, now we got left pedal. We're going to do the same direction, so we're going to talk about left cyclic, which is going to result in the nose pivoting around the left, pivoting around the aft rotor system. Any questions about that? And then, of course, since we're talking about hovering turns, what do we still have to talk about? What haven't we covered yet? Around the center. Around the center. We already said around the center is quite simply nothing more than what? Pedal input. <coughs> Any questions about that?
Okay. Now we're going to talk about the mixing units. Combines all control inputs into one integral output to the upper due boost actuators, moves both swash plate assemblies. Okay? You should be on page 97. Now, the first thing we need to be able to do to understand this is be able to identify the different axis in the flight control closet. And the way I like to do that is quite simply by drawing a rectangle, dividing it into quadrants. This is going to be station 95. This is going to be station 120. If this is station 95 and this is station 120, then this has to be the left side of the aircraft. This has to be the right side of the aircraft. Everyone tracking? We good? Now, what we are doing, gentlemen, just to make sure, we are looking straight down into the flight control closet from a top view. That's what we're doing. So right here would be your co-pilot. Everyone tracking with where we're at? Now, where I like to start is right here with the pitch. Why? Why would I want to start with the pitch? Because the pitch is the most identifiable axis. Why? Because what you have is called a dash actuator in the longitudinal or the pitch axis of the aircraft. This is your dash actuator, which stands for differential air speed hold. Now, what is its counterpart? Nothing more than those yellow connecting links. So do you think you can identify this 10 out of 10 times? If I can identify this 10 out of 10 times, then I can identify the pitch axis 10 out of 10 times. Agreed? Okay, now, from the pitch, I'm going to go forward. And this is going to be my thrust axis. And it's going to be my thrust axis. From there, I'm going to go to the left, and this is going to be my yaw axis. I can't even, wow, can't even make a Y today. That's going to be my yaw axis. And then by default, this must be my roll axis. We tracking? We good? Now, how do I remember that? Yes, sir. Are you talking about the ILCAS now? Or? No, right now all I'm doing is talking about the locations of the axis in the flight control closet. That's all I'm talking about. Okay. Are the ILCAs part of that? The integrated load control actuators part of that? Yes, sir. You're tracking. Okay. But right now, we're just wanting to identify the different axis inside the flight control closet. Why? Because in order to talk about that first stage mixing unit, you have to understand that the job of that first stage mixing unit is it's going to combine the input of the pitch and the thrust and the roll of the yaw. That's what the first stage mixing unit is doing. Now they are separate entities in there, but what happens is you have an outer bell crank and you have an inner bell crank. The outer bell crank will belong to either the pitch or the thrust axis, or excuse me, the pitch or the roll axis, and the inner bell crank will belong to the thrust and the yaw axis, and we'll show you that here in just a second. But so it combines those two inputs. From there, it's going to go aft to that second stage mixing unit. And what this is going to do is take these inputs 
and turn them into four control movements. It's going to go forward to one, upper, dual, boost, actuator. Upper, dual, boost, actuator. And then it's going to go through a series of control rods and bell cranks back to the back to an upper dual boost actuator upper dual boost actuator and then that's where the actual movements are going to occur okay now here we go gentlemen that all sounds mechanical to me doesn't it they not have a schematic or something like that huh they not have a schematic drawn for something as simple as that? It's kind of... Well, we have, that's the first stage and that's the second stage. No, I'm just talking about something. No, there's not something like that. Okay. You got that very first one that kind of shows you all the controls. But you got, the, you got what looks like this picture at the front, which will show you the first stage mixing unit. And there's the second stage mixing unit. And here's all those control tubes that I was just talking about going to the upper dual boost actuators. So what happens is at the first stage, as you look at the different inputs, you can see where it's going to move the different bell cranks. Now, why do you care what's happening at that mixing unit? Does it have anything to do with what you do up in the cockpit? No, but it has everything to do when you're standing looking in the closet. And you're exactly. It has pre-flight value. Why? Because in a little bit, what we're going to tell you is on pre-flight, this bell crank or that connecting rod has been known to be found bent. Has been known to be found bent. Well, if you don't know to look for it, you won't know what you're talking about. And what you're going to find out is that connecting rod right there and that portion of bell crank is associated with your thrust axis of the aircraft. Why? Because in a little bit when we talk about your flight control limitations and later on when we talk about while you're sitting on the ground, we said that we have to do what with the controls? Neutralize, Neutralize the controls and thrust at the ground detent. If you fail to put that thrust at the ground detent when you take away hydraulic pressure, what will happen is with control settling, the weight and the stress that's being put from that control settling and the, the weight of the rotor system will actually bend that connecting rod. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second. Any questions about anything we've covered so far? Okay, any questions? One, one, just one more time. Okay. Just go through all those control tubes going into those bell cranks and the inputs and outputs. So okay, one. this bell crank is actually two bell cranks. Correct. It's one entity, but it's actually two bell cranks. You got this one right here, which is this control tube and this control tube, which will be belong to one axis. And then you got this inner mechanism, which will belong this one, this connecting rod, and this one going out. Where these are going to go is that second stage mixing unit that we're going to talk about here in just a second. So which, which two have the connecting rods on the front that I can visibly see? We already know the one is the thrust. The, the inboard one, this the is the thrust. The, one's the, yaw. the other one's the yaw. Okay. And the yaw is not too bad because everybody's used to neutralizing the controls. It's maintaining the thrust at the, at the ground detent. And reality is you're not the problem. You're not the problem. What is the problem is our maintenance folks because they don't read the dash 10 like you do. And it tells you that prior to removing hydraulic pressure, 
you have to neutralize the controls and put the thrust at the ground detent. So as pilots, you know that. The crew members, for the most part, know that because they're responsible for the dash tan too. But mechanics work on this aircraft too. Mechanics can crank up the air APU, the auxiliary power unit, and turn the two power transfer units on, which provides hydraulic pressure to the flight controls. If they manipulate the controls and forget to put the thrust back at the ground detent and they remove the hydraulic pressure, that's where you can still find this bell crank right here, this connecting rod right here, you can find it bent from time to time. It's not as bad as it used to be because now everybody that cranks up the APU, the auxiliary power unit, has to be on orders now. And it's part of the training now to preclude this from happening because what, when this first happened, you know, we did the normal thing. The D model Chinook was still brand new. So we said, hey, Boeing, what in the heck is going on? And Boeing said, hey, Army, hold on, we'll figure it out. So they went to the drawing board, figured it out. Lo and behold, in the mail, we got a big old box, big old wooden box. We opened that wooden box, and in that wooden box was new connect connecting rods made out of stainless steel. So we said, okay, who up? We put it in there. And we thought we were going to be fat, dumb, and happy. Lo and behold, now, instead of bending the connecting rods, what was happening was we were finding cracks on these bell cranks. It's like, oh, Bowen. Man, the connecting rods were a heck of a lot easier to replace and fix than replacing that entire bell crank. What's going on? Bowen said, hey, we'll find out. Lo and behold, in the mail comes another box. And we're like, okay. We open it up. It's the old connecting rods. And we're like, okay, what's going on? And they said, here, add this to the dash 10. Neutralize the flight controls. Put the thrust at the ground de detent prior to removing hydraulic pressure, and everything will be fine. And that's where that comes from. Now, why do we still have a problem? Again, it's because the maintenance people initially were not trained to use the Dash 10, so they're not held responsible for any operator's manual cautions, notes, and warnings, so therefore they weren't aware of it. But now you should be pretty good, but you know people get in a hurry sometimes, and that's why you have to know to look for it. If you don't know to look for it at all, it's easy to miss. Okay, now we're looking at the second stage, and reality is, gentlemen, we're going to show you this, but if you were to ask me what was happening right here, all I could do is tell you that it's magic. That's all I can tell you, okay? Um, I have tried to figure out how anybody came up with that, and I don't know, okay? Those first stage mixing units and second stage mixing units, who figured that out? I got all the respect in the world for because that is a heck of a, an accomplishment. And for those that don't know, Boeing did not come up with the tandem rotor system design initially. A gentleman by the name of Frank Piasaki, Piasaki came up with it. And what he did was he sold the plans for the tandem rotor system design to Boeing for a dollar. A whole dollar. But what he maintained control of was the blueprints and the copyrights and everything associated with the flight controls. And that's where he made all his money. Nobody would want to redesign that. If you look at the, the H-21, which was the predecessor to the CH-47 and the um, 46, and you look at the 46, look at the 47, the only difference between the 46 and 47 is ours are a lot bigger than the 46. The design and everything is the same. If you looked at their flight control closet and look at our flight control closet, except for being smaller, you'd be able to figure out exactly what's going on. And again, you want to look for any type of damage. 
um, because there's a lot of nuts, there's a lot of um, cotter pins, and you want to make sure that there's no loose nuts or, or co missing cotter pins. Here we go, control stops. These are the control stops that's going to limit the amount of motion or movement allowed to occur in a different axis. Now these are not all the stops. There's one more set of stops. But these are the primary conglomeration of stops. Okay? The one the other one belongs strictly to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft or the pitch axis of the aircraft. And that's because the pitch axis has a wonderful thing called the dash, the differential airspeed. And since the dash is programmable, those stops had to be added in the longitude or axis of the aircraft. And we'll show you those later on. During engine shutdown, position the pedals and cyclic neutral and the thrust at the ground detent. Operator's manual caution, critical flight control components can be damaged if the thrust is not at the ground detent. Do we already cover that one pretty good? Everybody understand where that comes from now? Describe the flight and ground flight control limitations. So here we go. During ground operation, now one of the things, and I never thought I had to explain it, but some of the students didn't realize. When we talk about the ground control limitations, these are the limitations that are applicable with the rotor blades turning and we're sitting on the ground. Okay? If we're sitting on the ground and the rotor blades are not turning, then these limitations do not have to be adhered to. We track it. Now, the result of exceeding any of these limitations we're fixing to talk about, again, the result of any of these limitations or exceeding any of these limitations we're about to talk about is going to result in something we call droop stop pounding. And it is a phenomenon that is easily identified and if you're in droop stop pounding you will know it. There is no secret. Thrust, not below the ground detent. Now, like I told you, we're going to throw that term around a lot. But in a little bit when we break down these pallets, we will actually show you how the ground detent is identified and exactly what it is. Right now, you just have to know that thrust not below the ground detent. So the first question that would come to mind or the first thing that you should realize is what? Thrust not below the ground detent. That means you can go below it. Good job. So now what's the next question? Why? When would I go below the ground detent? For auto rotation. Good job, sir. Good job. The purpose of being able to go below the ground detent is to allow the rotor blades to accelerate in the need or the necessity for auto rotation. Any questions about that? So what do you think? Just being smart people, when we talk about the ground detent, what do you think we're going to show you? Can you picture something in your head? Detent lever, I think. What? A detent lever or something like okay, that. Okay, we're going to show you a lever. But what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be a stop. That's what it's going to be. But this stop is going to be special in the fact that what? Even though it's a stop, with applied force, it's going to be able to go through that stop. And so when we look at it, now it's going to make sense. Now, F cyclic, two inches. Now you're going to read that two inches a lot in this aircraft. Why? We're going to refer to it on roll-on landings. When we do our roll-on landings, what's it going to tell us to do? It's going to tell us to pull two inches of aft cyclic in. Now, 
just so we understand, if all you did, gentlemen, was pull two inches of acyclic in, that aircraft's going to run right off the runway. Okay? Now, when we do two-wheel taxi, it's going to tell you the first thing you do is what? Two inches of acyclic. When we go to do a pinnacle, it's going to tell you two inches of acyclic. When you go to do a downslope, it's going to tell you to pull two inches of acyclic. Fair enough? Okay, so now let's talk about what that two inches of acyclic actually does for us. By pulling in two inches of acyclic, what did we say was created in the rotor system? Differential, Differential collective pitch. Meaning what? So if I pull in two inches of acyclic, my aft rotor blades are going to collectively and evenly do what? Decrease. My forward rotor blades are going to collectively and evenly increase. And here's what's going to happen. You ready? As a result of that, that forward landing gear might come light. That's it. That's all that's going to happen, gentlemen. Contrary to popular belief, when people think about those two inches of acyclic, they think that they're preventing that. You're not preventing that. The only thing you're doing by pulling in two inches of aft cyclic is ensuring that that aft rotor, excuse me, that that aft landing gear stays planted. That's all you are doing, gentlemen. So in other words, we said that we use two inches for a roll on landing. And we said that if you did nothing more than put in two inches of aft cyclic, that aircraft would roll right off the runway. So what else do I need to do to stop the aircraft if the two inches of aft is only making sure that aft landing gear stays down? You have to pull in power. For two-wheel taxi, I initially pull in two inches of aft cyclic. All that does is make sure my aft landing gear stays planted. I pull in power, and now it allows me to do a two-wheel taxi configuration. Any movement from here on is going to be flight control inputs. Power setting, if I pull more power in, it allows me to go backwards. If I put less power in, it allows me to go forward. Left pedal, right pedal, and that's how you two-wheel taxi this beast. But again, all that two inches of aft does is make sure that aft landing gear stays planted. If you, if you put on, if you put on or put in more than two inches of aft cyclic, what will happen as a result of putting in more aft cyclic, you'll get into droop stop pounding. That's the only thing that's going to happen. Any questions about that? Okay, now, you'll notice they went straight to two inches of aft cyclic. What didn't they talk about that do you think should be a control limitation? Forward. Forward. And why didn't they? Because it's going to be too veritable based on what? Based on what's underneath the rotor system, how high it is, based on the ground ahead of me, am I on an upslope? So it's too veritable. So there isn't a set figure or a set position that will result in a guaranteed contact or anything else. You won't get into droop stop pounding for forward cyclic. You'll hit the ground first. And if you're silly enough to let it hit the ground, then I guess we get what we deserve. Now, when we talk about the two inches of aft, we're going to talk about a stick position indicator here in just a little bit. But here's the one we're going to talk about, one inch of lateral. Now, what will happen with one inch of lateral, what happens with lateral cyclic? We either tilt both rotor discs to the right 
or we tilt both rotor discs to the left. What will happen is if you exceed that one inch, again we'll get into droop stop pounding. Okay? You'll get into droop stop pounding long before you get into dynamic rollover. Any questions about that? Now the problem with lateral cyclic is we do not have a stick position for lateral cyclic. So it's all going to be a control feel. So if you are putting pressure one way or another and you start to exceed that one inch, you'll get into droop stop pounding, you just stop what you're doing. Now, pedals three quarters of an inch or .75 depending on where you read it. It's identified by both. Now, mark my words, gentlemen. I promise, I promise you will each exceed this one in your careers. Except for you two. Unless you're up front playing with the controls with the rotor blades turning. Now, why? Because this aircraft, unlike any other aircraft, adjusts its pedals independent of each other. Any other aircraft, normally, you turn a knob and both pedals go out, both pedals come in. In this aircraft, they, they adjust independent of each other. And what you have is a series of holes. Down here, you have a series of holes. There's five of them to be exact. With a spring, that spring right there makes those pedals naturally want to pull forward or pull aft towards you. So what happens is with your boot, you're going to kick this mechanism right here out, which is going to pull a pin right here. If you lessen up on the, on the force that you're putting on those pedals, those pedals are going to come for you, towards you. If you push on them, they're going to go back. Now, if you have the right pedal in hole number three and the left pedal in hole number two, you would think that you would catch it, right? Everybody's going to say, Psh, we should know that. But what's going to happen is as soon as you apply hydraulic pressure, what do you think you're going to do? Up. Oh. And then there's no way to tell that you have a misadjusted. So when's the next time that you're going to see that? or when's the next time you're going to know that you made a mistake. And that is, when you accelerate these engines, when you take these engine condition levers from the ground and you start to take them up towards flight, once they hit a certain rotor RPM, it'll start to get into droop stop pounding. And then you know you messed up. So you just abort the maneuver, come back to the ground. The co-pilot will block the pedals because you know the pilot messed it up. Why? Because when we accelerate the engines from ground to flight, the pilot is on the flight controls at that time. So it has to be their mistake. Now, why did they make that mistake? How do missions come down the pike? Hey Jeff, we need you to go get plan this mission and have it ready to go. Right? By the way, you've got five minutes to make it happen. So what, what happens is we get into hurry up mode. It's not that we forget about it. Okay, when's the next time? When do you all do most of your flying? At night. At night. What happens to our visibility at night? Okay, and they use those green flashlights. Why? Because we don't want to destroy our night vision. Depth our depth perception, what little we have at night, right? So therefore, you may not be able to see it very clearly, and that's when people tend to make the mistake. Okay? So you all will make that mistake, I promise you, unless you don't stay in Chinooks very long. And especially since most of you are young in your career, so therefore you'll all see it. Ensure that your left pedal and right pedal are adjusted to corresponding positions prior to engine start. All right, describe the flight control components. There's one of your babies. They hadn't put Bearcat 3 on it yet, but they did the white U.S. Army. Okay, now we're going to look at our flight controls. As we look at our flight controls, we're primarily going to be talking about our secondary controls. 
Why are we going to be talking about our secondary controls? Because our primary controls are direct mechanical linkages between what you do up in the cockpit through the flight controls up to the rotor system. And they are directly linked to you. There are no, there's nothing in between. The pieces and parts that we're going to get ready to talk about are creature comforts. Meaning what? Meaning if they're not working, most of them do not constitute a red X. They're there to help you fly this aircraft. They're not required to fly this aircraft. As we look at the controls, what we're going to be doing is breaking down everything on the pallet at station 95 and then everything on the pallet at station 120. That's what we're going to be doing. The pallet at station 95 is going to consist of the following. Your yaw ilka, integrated lower control actuator. Your thrust ilka, integrated lower control actuator. And then we have our yaw and thrust pallet. At station 120, you have your roll, integrated lower control actuator. You have your pitch, integrated lower control actuator. And then you have your pitch and roll pallet. Now, when we talk about the pallets, this is what your pallet looks like. You have two of them. They are nothing more than two pieces of thin sheet metal with a honeycombing and a sealant to prevent moisture from getting in there with a series of nut plates. But what you need to understand is these pallets are so sophisticated that we can pull a pallet out, replace as many components as we need to on this pallet, rig the pallet, put it back in the aircraft, and all we have to do is a rig check of the aircraft. We don't have to do a complete re-rig of the aircraft. That's how sophisticated these pallets are. All your secondary controls are going to be mounted to these pallets. We're going to start off with the thrust pallet, which we said was located at what station? 95. 95. Now, keeping in mind that the components on that pallet are going to be the thrust and the yaw. But right now, all we're going to do is talk about the thrust components. We're going to talk about the balancing springs. We're going to talk about the thrust cockpit control driver actuator, the droop eliminator potentiometer. Now, what we will add to that one is we will talk about the thrust control position transducer, which is applicable to the 714 engine. 712 has the droop eliminator potentiometer. The 714 has a control position transducer, and we'll talk about that as we go along. You will have to add it because we haven't made the changes relative to some 14s on this one, on this class yet. But we will talk about everything. There's your ground detent capsule and your viscous dampener. Located at station 95, the first thing we're going to talk about is the viscous dampener. Here's the viscous dampener. You're going to find out you actually have four of these. Why four? Four axis. Everybody lets that throw them, okay? There's, reality is, if you have a good grasp of the components in the systems, there are no hard questions. So they'll ask you, why four of them? Four axis. Every axis has one. Right now, the one we're talking about is on the thrust axis. But when we talk about them, they're all identical. They improve control feel. How do they improve control feel? Here's what happens. This control arm on here is connected to a little butterfly valve in here. Inside of here, it's fluid. Now, here we go. What do I know about fluid? What do we know about fluid and physics? Slows down the motion. Slows down the motion. What else? Why does it slow down the motion? 
Okay. Okay. We know fluid is non compressible. Gentlemen, fluid cannot be compressed. Fluid of any kind cannot be compressed. Period. So we have fluid in here. And then you have this mechanism right here. And quite simply, all this mechanism does is slides into here, adjusts everything out, and then what happens is that mechanism is going to control how fast that fluid is allowed to move in there, therefore slowing down or improving the control feel. When's it going to improve the control feel? When you push the control centering device release. Why? Because our flight control closet is vertical. So everything when I push the control centering device release would want to go which way? Down. So we had to put components in there, they had to put control components in there to improve that and prevent that in some cases. So what happens is as you push the control centering device release, now what happens is that arm has to move against that fluid which is going to control or slow down how fast that moves. Likewise, if you're yanking and banking on the controls, this will slow it down somewhat. Why? Because again, that fluid can only move so fast in there. Any questions about that? Okay. Droop eliminator potentiometer. Droop eliminator potentiometer, we said, was applicable to what system? 712 engines only. Now, what you're going to find out is you have two pods. A left pod and a right pod. What do you think those pods are going to be associated with? Left and right engine. Left and right engine. Number one engine, number two engine. It follows the left and right rule. What's going to happen is through the bell clank, what you have is a T connection. Here's that T connection. And what's going to happen in response to thrust inputs, that T connection is going to result in these rods either coming out are going in. And it's going to use a variable resistance signal. The more the rods are in, the higher the resistance. The less they're in, the less the resistance. And that's going to be interpreted by the N2 system as a increase or decrease in fuel. And therefore, two things. One, as you make power changes, because these droop eliminators are adjusted, it's going to cause the same amount of change in both engines to keep those engines matched for you. But then the tendency is, when you make power changes, the tendency is for what to occur? Rotor droop, right? So all that's going to happen is this is going to increase or decrease the amount of fuel ahead of time, therefore preventing rotor droop from occurring. Yes, sir? And the engine deep trim switch, are those uh, connected to those or? No, sir. It's still part of the N2 system, but this is a separate entity altogether. The switches are just one of the controlling features. You're tracking. Anything else? Now, Unfortunately, gentlemen, the rest of this you're going to have to write down. In place of that droop eliminator potentiometer is what's known as a control position transducer. We call it a CPT for short. The only difference is you have a cannon, two cannon plugs connected to a control rod that's going to move as a result of what? power changes, thrust changes, only now what's going to happen is that signal is going to be sent to two DECUs, digital electronic control units. And now what's going to happen is those computers are going to say, hey, pilot implemented a change, we've got to compensate or add fuel or subtract fuel to compensate for rotor droop. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, the DECUs in anticipation 
of that power change is either going to add fuel or subtract fuel, still resulting in preventing rotor droop. And it's still going to keep those engines matched. The only real difference is instead of going to a control box, it's going to the digital electronic control units, which is nothing more than a fancy dancy term for what? A computer. What computer? The engine computer. So why two cannon plugs? Why two cannon plugs, gentlemen? It has to match. I mean, they have to stay matched. Okay, so two digital electronic control units because of two engines. Two engines. And, it, and the thing about it is, is, is when people ask questions like that, people think, oh, that's too simple. There's got to be more to it. No. Two cannon plugs, two computers, two computers, two engines. What's it still going to do? It's still going to prevent rotor droop, and it's still going to help keep those engines matched. The only difference is, is the signals are going to your computers or your digital electronic control units instead of a control box. Any questions about that? All right, detent capsule, here it is. There it is. And we said it was nothing more than a what? It's nothing more than a stop. So there's the stop. And you'll notice, if you look at the picture, connected to that thrust bell crank, here's the thrust bell crank, is that additional arm. And that arm is going to line up with that detent capsule. And so what's going to happen is movement happens it's going to come and contact that stop, stopping the movement. Unless what? Unless I apply more force to push up against that spring and now push down on it. Okay? And now it's going to push down on it. So do you think you'll feel it in the controls? Yep. And if I hold the thrust control trigger, and I let the spring do its job, it's going to bring it right back to where? Ground to the ground detent. And so when they talk about the ground detent, that's what they're talking about, gentlemen. Any questions about that? And there it is. The balancing springs. Now these are fun to talk about. What you're going to find out is we have four balancing springs. Why do we have four balancing springs? We got four axes. Now, except for the springs being different sizes, their job is the same. What is their job? Their job, quite simply, is to counteract gravity. Why? Because our flight control closet is vertical. Any questions about that? Do we need to make that any harder than that? Okay, now, I used to pass this spring around. I don't pass it anymore because for some reason people like to spin it. And for some reason, it always comes towards me. You know, if I didn't know better, I think I'd, I need to have a complex. But here's the balancing spring. What you're going to notice as we go through this, they're different sizes based on the axis that they're in. But their jobs are the same as to counteract gravity. Now, the thrust CCDA, cockpit control, driver actuator. What you're going to find out, gentlemen, is we have two cockpit control driver actuators. One is for the thrust axis, one is for the pitch axis. Now, the cockpit control driver actuators are commonly referred to as CCDAs. The problem with memorizing that they're CCDAs is CCDAs do not help you keep in mind what they do for you. If you remember that they are cockpit control driver actuators, it will help you keep in mind what they do for the aircraft, what they do for you. 
Okay. Now I'm going to put the pitch one down because we're going to talk about the thrust one. And what you're going to find out is incorporated into the cockpit control driver actuator is quite simply a magnetic brake. And what you're going to find out is as you apply power, it releases the brake. As you apply power, it releases the brake. And you're going to notice it will actually tell you where it's drawing power from. But what does that mean to you right now? Zip, zilch, not and nothing. But later on, when, after electrical class, it will mean something to you. So we'll talk more about it in detail later on. But what you do need to keep in mind is that it requires the, the application of electricity to release it. Now what do I know about electricity? Electricity can fail, can it? Can go away. So there is a possibility of losing the ability to release this magnetic brake. Agreed? No power, I can't release that magnetic brake. Now what you have built into this cockpit control driver actuator is a mechanical clutch mechanism. This is the mechanical clutch. Now what I will do is I will bring the pitch back up here and show you that's how you can tell the difference between the pitch CCDA, cockpit control driver actuator, and the thrust cockpit control driver actuator. Now, why does this one need a clutch? Because if we lose electrical power and the magnetic brakes incorporated into here, we still need to be able to move that thrust control to be able to land this aircraft. Agreed? So what happens is with an applied force of 7 to 23 pounds, you can still move it. Now, they're going to use a term called slipping the clutch. Slipping the clutch is defined as not pushing in the thrust control trigger and moving the controls. If you move the controls without pushing in that thrust control trigger, it does not release the mag brake, which means now you're going to be slipping this mechanism. But here's the problem. We said that this is connected to what? Thrust. A pallet, right? And we said those pallets are quite simply two thin pieces of sheet metal with honeycombing and a series of nut plates, right? Well, what would happen to these nut plates if I just kept moving it without releasing that magnetic brake? it wears out those nut plates. And then the next thing you're going to hear over the intercom or the next thing you're going to be saying to that crew chief or flight engineer in the back is, hey chief, man this thrust axis is pretty sloppy. And that's because some people are under the impression that they still have to slip this clutch. Okay? Here's what I'm going to do for you gentlemen. We're going to be a little bit morbid. Okay? This was on an aircraft that crashed. Okay? It actually killed five people. Okay? And what you're going to notice is it's damaged pretty significantly to include that this control arm is bent. Okay? Despite this control arm being bent, I can still move it. If I can move it now, you're going to be able to move any of them out on the aircraft. So if you want to slip one, slip this one. You're not going to hurt anything. When we talk about doing flight control travel and hydraulics check, all you're doing is going through the full range of motion. Now it's going to tell you somewhere in that motion you want to let go of that thrust control trigger. Agreed? Agreed. But all you have to do is apply a minor amount of force and say, yep, it's holding it in place. Reapply the thrust control trigger and continue moving your motion. Whether it's on the way up or on the way down is irrelevant. Nobody cares. As long as you check it. But all you're checking for is that that 
thrust control trigger and that magnetic brake holds it in place. You're not actually trying to slip it to see if it's going to work. Any questions about that? Okay, next. What was it? What, was that AC power or DC power? It's actually DC power. Okay? It's actually DC power. So it's on the emergency bus or backup? It's actually off the essential DC bus, which is connected to your battery. Okay? But when I say the essential DC bus, that doesn't mean anything to you. That when we do electrical, I'll bring it back up again. Okay? So that you can put two plus two together and make sure you come up with four. Okay. Now, cockpit control driver actuator. Cockpit control driver actuator. Obviously, and in the one that's coming around, this panel is actually open. And what you're going to notice in that panel is a series of gears. Why? Cockpit control driver actuator. In other words, those gears are going to be connected to a motor that's going to result in them being driven. As a result of this arm being moved by those gears being driven, your actual cockpit controls are going to move. Hence, cockpit control driver actuators. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is what's going to control those electric motors, or that electric motor, isn't it? AFCS, Advanced Flight Control System. In response to what? Altitude hold, whether it's bare altitude hold or rate altimeter hold is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. The computer, computer, the number one computer is going to send a signal to that motor in there and actually manipulate that control arm. And it's going to result in this thrust moving as if you had moved it. It will release the mag brake. It will move the thrust control just like it's supposed to. Hence, cockpit control driver actuator. As a result of those computer inputs, the thrust control is actually going to be moving. And all you have to do is keep your hand on there. Why? Because if that thrust control, that computer starts to do the wrong thing, you're right there to stop it. Questions? All right. Did we talk about everything right there? It must get a little tiresome on a cross-country flight with that thing on IFR or whatever. No. No, because you're going to tell the aircraft maintain pressure altitude, 2,000 oh, feet. I got the fact of what it does, and that's a great thing. But I mean, like, I don't know, I can't speak for a Blackhawk, but I know for a fact that ours it doesn't move our collector. I mean, it stays where it's at. I mean. It does, it does take all those outside inputs and adjust to keep you at 2,000 feet as the power, you know, whatever it needs it to, but I couldn't imagine that thing just moving all the time with your hand on it without you putting inputs into it. Yeah, it uh, well that's, the Blackhawk do. There's, no there's no altitude hold in the Blackhawk, and see that's where it's different. You don't uh, want to know that though, if you're, you're picking up a sling load or you're, it's maintaining your altitude or whatever, where you, you're going to want to know what the aircraft's doing, just rest your hand on there. Going down or whatever. Yeah, it's a surprise. Kind of weird in Apache. It doesn't no, do that. Doesn't move it at all. Yeah. yeah, see, ours will move only because of the fact that, like it was brought up, if it fails and it starts to push up against your hand, you can sit there and say, oh, no, you don't. Because the nice thing about it is when we talk about the advanced flight control system, that system is to aid you. That system is to reduce your workload. It is not to take away the control of the aircraft from you. So you can override all that fancy dancy stuff. So if that thrust control starts to push up or pull down, all you have to do is push the thrust control trigger and you'll take control back from the system. Is it automatically cut off out hold then? No, sir. Thrust? No, sir. Good question. Yes, yeah, ours, ours kicks off in the event that if the collective is moved outside of a half of an inch to maintain that altitude, it'll tell you. So I mean, you have to re-engage with it. Yeah, see ours won't. The only thing that'll kick off for us is heading select. 
if you have heading select engaged, and there's several reasons why it'll kick off, if you do any of those, it'll kick off and then you have to re-engage it back on. But all our other features are automatic, except for thrust control. Remember, who initially turns on thrust control? Or altitude hold? Whoever has the command select. Yeah. Nope, command select doesn't care about for that. Because basically the only thing you're going to do to engage altitude hold is go to whatever altitude you want to maintain, whether it's using the red altimeter or whether it's using barometric pressure is irrelevant. Once you get to that altitude, stabilize at that altitude, then you have to reach down there and push a button that we're going to show you in a little bit later. Okay? Other than that, it's the only axis does not have automatic control. So the thrust axis will always belong to you unless you give it up to the computer. Unlike some of the other features we'll talk about um, next week for AFCS. And AFCS is six hours. You got a six hour block of instructions on AFCS. Now we're going to talk about the yaw pallet, keeping in mind that all we're doing now is talking about the yaw pieces and parts. The yaw and the thrust pallet are identical. They're both located where? Which pallet? Station 95. Station 95. That's the only way you have to identify it. Station 95. Okay? We're going to talk again about a viscous dampener. Now we're going to talk about a magnetic brake. We're going to talk about a balancing spring and a control centering spring and a control position transducer. First thing we're going to look at is inside that flight control you have your magnetic brake. Here's your magnetic brake. Okay, easily identified. Guess what, gentlemen? In order to release the mag brake in here, you have to do what? Push the control centering device release. But what's that do for you? It applies power to the system or applies power to it and then allows you to manipulate, in this case, the yaw axis. You're going to find out you actually have two of these. So it's not on the pedals? You have to do it on, on the actual? Yes, sir. Okay. It's on your actual cyclic control. What you're going to find out when you push the cyclic control, you're going to reduce the pitch, roll, and yaw. The only one that you don't release by pushing this button is the thrust, and it has its own trigger. Good. It's going to apply power and allow you to make a movement. Any questions about that? Control centering spring. Now, as we look at the control centering spring, here it is, gentlemen. There's your control centering spring. Now, it's going to be connected, in this case, to the mag brake. Meaning what? Meaning, if I release that mag brake and I move or make a control input, it's going to let it move. Fair enough. And the whole assembly is going to move. But now what would happen if I don't release the mag brake? Can I still move the controls? Sure. sure I can. But now I'm going to be pushing against this spring. If I was going to translate what this is for you, what would I call it? A force trim. Now, remember I told you I was going to tell you what there is in the system to help you not over control this aircraft? What they're going to teach you, gentlemen, is when you first bring this aircraft up to the hover, you really only have to worry about your lateral axis. You don't have to worry about your longitudinal axis because you have your longitudinal cyclic trim actuators in the system. You don't have to worry about your pedals with AFCS on because you have heading hold. You already know how much power to pull in. Why? Because you're going to do your performance planning data and your performance planning data is going to say at this gross weight, at this pressure altitude, at this FAT, you should have to pull in this amount of power to bring it to a 10-foot hover. 
So the only thing you really have to do is worry about lateral control. And what they'll do is they'll show you to get it hovering. And then once you get it hovering, then you want to push your control centering device release. That will prevent you from attempting to over control this aircraft. And you'll actually find out with the AFCS on, she hovers quite nicely. Questions? All right, then here we go. Now, the control centering device. What you have to keep in mind is if you don't release that mag brake, you're pushing up against this spring. So what's going to happen as soon as you lighten up on the pressure? It's going to go back to the mechanical position. We tracking? Any questions about that? If I push the control centering device release and it releases the mag brake, then it's going to reposition to whatever new settings you have. And that's going to be on any of the different axes. So you're saying it's better to come off the ground and control centering device but release. Get Without the control and the lateral and then push the button reset up. Yes, sir. And that's what they'll pretty much show you because then that way you avoid the tendency of over controlling this aircraft. Also, in this aircraft, it's a real freaky deaky thing in the fact that with the AFCS on, the really the only thing you're really worried about is the lateral axis. You already have the power setting figured out. You don't need pedals. And longitudinally wise, unless you have a major tailwind or headwind, the LCTs are going to do their job and then it's going to actually level it off. And so really, really, you only have to worry about the lateral axis anyway. So you stabilize it, hit the control centering device release, and then you're done. Now, AFCS off, you don't have any of the extra hold features, so now you have to control all the axis, but it's the same thing. You don't want to push the control centering device release until you have everything stabilized. But now, you do have to maintain heading of the aircraft. You still know what power setting. And you still don't have to worry about the longitudinal axis of the aircraft unless you have a major tailwind or headwind. So you're still just to the lateral. The only thing you have to remember is you're going to have to do the pedals when, uh, with the AFCS off. Any questions about that? Now, viscous dampeners. Do we have to beat you up on that one again? A viscous dampener is a viscous dampener is a viscous dampener. It provides control feel, artificial feel for when you release that mag brake. Balancing springs. Now, what did we say the balancing springs do for us, gentlemen? Counteract, Counteract gravity. gravity. But you'll notice this one gives na the name or a name to if gravity was allowed to impact or influence the yaw axis, it would manifest itself as pedal creep. Okay? But that's what the spring is preventing, is pedal creep, as a result of what? As a result of gravity, that's all. Any questions about that? Now, here we go, another new piece. Control position transducer. And you notice I didn't pass this mechanism around yet. Why? Because there's your control position transducer right here. All that's going to happen as a result of control inputs, you're going to notice that control position transducer is going to move. Why? Because what you're going to find out is this aircraft will compensate or the computers will compensate for forces acting on the aircraft. So what does the computer have to know? Is it a force acting on the aircraft or is it a response for a control input? And so quite simply, the CPT, the control position transducer, you'll notice there's two cannon plugs. Why two cannon plugs? Three. Two advanced flight control computers. Two AFCSs. All it does is say computers, yes, the pilot induced the movement, therefore allow for the new movement. Or computers, the pilot didn't induce the movement, and therefore it will correct for it automatically. Any questions about that? What was this again? 
How many of these do we have? Two. Which axes have them? Yaw and roll. Now, how many axes have mag brakes? All four. All four have mag brakes. But the mag brakes for the pitch and the thrust, we said, were incorporated into what? The control position transducer. Excuse me. The cockpit control driver actuator, it's incorporated into the CCDA. Okay, so every axis has a mag brake, but you have these in your roll and yaw, and you have these in your pitch and thrust. Any questions about that? Okay, so there's your mag brake. Now, the control centering springs and the CPT, or the control position transducer, if you're not careful, this will bite you. Okay, so be careful, okay? Now we're going to talk about the roll components, which is located on pallet what? 120. That's how we break them down. We're going to talk about the magnetic brake. We're going to talk about the viscous dampener. We're going to talk about the control centering spring. We're going to talk about the balancing spring. And we're going to talk about the control position transducer. Now, located on pallet station 125 contains a control centering spring. Do we have to beat you up on that one again? It contains one of those. Acts as what? What's it act like? Forced. A force trim. We're not gonna we're not gonna make it harder than it has to be. Do we need to talk about it anymore? Viscous dampener. Do we need to talk about it anymore? The balancing spring itself. Do we need to talk about it anymore? And then last but not least, the control position transducer CPT. There we go. Roll axis is done. Let's look at the pitch axis. Now we're going to talk about a pitch axis cockpit control driver actuator, a balancing spring, a viscous dampener, excuse me, a control centering spring, a viscous dampener, and a balancing spring, and a CPT. Magnetic brake. Do we need to beat you up on a magnetic brake? The only thing we have to remember in this case, where is the magnetic brake located? Inside the CCDA, inside the cockpit control driver actuator. Driver actuator control, AFCS trim switch. Now, here we go. It's incorporated into the cockpit control driver actuator. Here we go. It has a motor which is going to drive the actuator portion. Now, in response to what? What's going to drive it? The AFCS. The AFCS, and that's the number one answer, and that is actually wrong. Okay? The AFCS does not have anything to do with this cockpit control driver actuator. Okay? So what would drive it? We're going to introduce you to a new switch. You have a, what's known as an AFCS trim switch. Now, what you're going to find out is this AFCS trim switch operates and functions both laterally and longitudinally. Longitudinally, it is a relationship between this switch and the motor inside this cockpit control driver actuator. Okay, now watch this, gentlemen. It goes from here to here. So will this work? AFCS off as well as AFCS on? Or does it have to be AFCS on only? Say AFCS on. Why now? I would say AFCS only. Okay. 
AFCS only? What do you say? It should work without it. And actually it does, which is why I put them side by side. It goes from here to here. Did it have anything to do with the computer? Did I say that it went through the computer? No. Okay. Which is why you can increase and de decrease your airspeed using the AFCS trim switch, AFCS off or on. It's irrelevant. But laterally, it requires the AFCS to be on. Any questions? Okay. So when we look at the CCDA, the cockpit control driver actuator, You'll notice, though, it doesn't have that mechanical clutch. It still incorporated a mag brake, didn't it? Well, if it doesn't, or it still incorporates a mag brake, why doesn't it need the clutch? What does the pitch axis have that the thrust axis did not have? Viscous not viscous dampeners. They all have viscous dampeners. What are you actually meaning to say? It doesn't have a control centering spring. What is the purpose of the control centering spring? It allows you to manipulate that pitch axis even though you did not release that mag brake. You're going to push up against that spring and the same thing's going to apply. The axis is going to move, but as soon as you lighten up the pressure, since the arm didn't move to reposition, it's going to take it back to wherever it was. Which is why, if I'm flying along, the other great thing about these control centering springs being in the system, if I'm flying along, I have the airspeed I wish to maintain, I have the altitude I wish to maintain, I'm wings level, and now all I want to do is implement a change to my heading. All I have to do is take my lateral axis and move it in the direction that I want to go. The aircraft turns and as I lighten up the pressure, what's it going to do to the aircraft? It's going to take it right back to my old settings. Pretty neat advantage, right? Any questions about that? Now, the cyclic stick position, longitudinally or pitch axis, we have a stick position indicator. That stick position indicator is going to be located on the right side of the cannon cancel, closest to whom? The pilot. The increments are going to be broken down in inches. That's what it's going to be broken down into. That's what it looks like right there underneath your air control knobs closest to the pilot and that's a close up of it. And so when you see that four, that's going to be four inches. The other thing you have to realize as you look at that mechanism, what you have in there is this is the clear tube. You actually have a mechanism that looks like that. You want to align the bottom of this nipple, excuse me, with whatever position you want. We tracking? We good? That's what you want to do. Now, you're going to have an operator's manual caution, or excuse me. We're going to do flight control travel and hydraulics check. During flight control travel and hydraulics check, the first position you're going to check is the pitch axis. And what you're going to be looking for is a minimum of seven inches forward, a minimum of four inches aft. Note the emphasis, minimum. So if I have eight inches of forward cyclic, am I okay? Yes. If I have five inches of aft cyclic, am I okay? Yes. Okay. Now, there's one more thing that we need to talk about. is slope operations. 
slope operations. Now, the only time this is going to manifest itself is if I'm parked on a slope and I shut down on the slope. Meaning what? Meaning when I go to crank the aircraft back up, part of my through flight check is to do flight control travel and hydraulics check. So now I'm parked on a slope and that slope is greater than four degrees. Now what it's going to tell me in an operator's manual caution is that I may not have the minimum of seven inches forward, four inches of aft. Why? Because what's going to happen is being parked on that slope, we have in the longitude or the pitch axis of the aircraft, we have this dash actuator. You're going to find out the dash actuator is going to program to not only airspeed, but pitch attitude of the aircraft. What does a slope manifest itself as? It's a pitch attitude, right? So what's going to happen in response to that, this dash is going to either extend or retract depending on its upslope or downslope. As a result of that, you may not have those same minimums. Seven inches forward, minimum of four inches of F. Where, where does it get that input from as far as the degree of the slope? You'll see it on your, on your vertical gyro indicator or your attitude indicator. So if you're parked on a slope greater than, oh, where, yeah, it gets okay. it from the vertical gyro. Okay. The AFCS computer gets it from the vertical That's gyro. The yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. But you're talking about starting it up, right? You're starting it up. If I park on a slope, here we go. I come in. I do my slope landing. Okay, good. Good job. Let's go. Okay, and we go home. That minimum of seven inches forward, four inches of aft, you would have never seen it. Which the only time you're going to see it is if I shut down on that slope and I go to crank it back up during flight control travel and hydraulics check. How do the PGIs know that you're in the slope if you shut it down? Doesn't it level up or nope. set itself? What will happen is why the power is still applied, it would have already programmed the dash. Okay? Once you're on the slope, you're going to turn the ASCS off, which is now going to lock the dash actuator program to that slope. So even though the vertical gyro signal goes away, it would not have affected the dash. Very good question. Anything else? And then there's your operator's manual caution. The 8-2-8 is no longer applicable. It's on a new page. But basically, it's still under Chapter 8. Any questions about that? Now we're going to look at the integrated lower control actuators. As we look at the integrated lower control actuators, what's going to happen at the integrated lower control actuators? is your mechanical input is now going to be turned into a hydraulic movement. Why? Because that with over 2,500 pounds of pressure, excuse me, over 2,500 pounds of weight, there's not anyone in this room that can lift 2,500 pounds. You two are the biggest people in here. How much can you lift? I don't know. Okay. But you know it's not 2,500 pounds, right? Probably not. So what's going to happen is this is your integrated lower control actuator. And this one still hydraulic fluid comes out. What you're going to find out is your integrated lower control actuator is broken down into two portions. Okay? Two portions. The two portions are your boost portion and your extensible link portion. The boost portion belongs to the pilot. The extensible link portion belongs to the AFCS. We tracking? We good? It's further broken down into two systems. The top is the number one system. What systems? Number one AFCS for the extensible link. 
and number one flight control hydraulics for both the boost and the extensible link. The bottom is broken into the number two system. Number two AFCS, number two flight control hydraulics. Questions? Okay, now, here we go. I'm going to flip this around. What happens as a response to your control inputs, you're going to move this portion right here. Okay? You're going to move this portion right here. Everybody see that? In response to you moving this portion right here, this control arm is going to move. And I'm going to go ahead and slide over here just a little bit so make sure everybody can see. Can everybody see? Okay. Now what's going to happen inside of here, you're going to be manipulating a mechanism. And that mechanism looks just like this. So what's going to happen is you're going to move this mechanism right here. You're going to move this mechanism right here, okay? As a result of moving this mechanism, what's going to happen is hydraulic fluid is going to come out one way and fill a chamber and go back the other way. We tracking? So what it looks like is this. Nice try. Okay. So this right here is that mechanism. Can everybody see that? Can you see that, sir? Okay. Is that mechanism. So what's going to happen is based on that control movement, Fluid, okay, what's going to happen is you'll notice there's two slits right here. There's two slits right here. If fluid goes in through this slit, it's going to fill this chamber right here. And filling this chamber, what's going to happen as a result of that this entire piston is going to move up. Now moving this control rod right here. This control rod right here is a single entity. Why does that become important to understand? Because later on, when we talk about a loss of hydraulics, either number one flight or number two flight, you'll notice that other than restoring hydraulic pressure by turning on the power transfer unit if there's no signs of leaks or high temperature, there's no other response required by you. If you didn't do anything, those flight controls would still move as long as you have one flight control hydraulic system remaining. So in other words, if I get a number one flight control hydraulic caution capsule and I don't do anything, this aircraft will still fly just fine. No harm, no foul. Okay? Now you'll notice on the overhead panel, on the bottom right hand control marked as the hydraulics, you have a switch marked flight control hydraulics. What does it say? One on, both two on, right? Now, if I lose a flight tr control hydraulic system, why doesn't it require me to make a movement to that switch? Because the redundancy is automatic, gentlemen. Why? Because if the top portion, if the top portion of this ILCA is using the number one flight control hydraulics, and the bottom portion is using the number two flight control hydraulics. 
if this hydraulic system goes away and this one's still there and this is a single entity shaft as a result of this one moving the system that rod is still going to move agree good and that's where the redundancy comes in it's an automatic redundancy other than attempting to restore that hydraulic pressure that's the only thing to that emergency procedure there's no control limitations there's no reduction of capability there's no nothing it's going to do the same thing why because the same rod is being moved now the other thing besides providing hydraulic assist the boost portion is going to prevent control feedback now that sounds tough but reality is it's not gentlemen we know fluid is what non-compressible non so if I trap X amount of fluid right here and X amount of fluid right here no matter how much force that rotor system puts on those controls nothing is going to move any questions about that any questions about your boost portion now boost wise we have four ilkas we have one for the pitch axis one for the roll axis one for the yaw axis and one for the thrust axis does everybody understand that I have four integrated lower control actuators so when you look at it again your redundancy is this is a single entity shaft in this picture you can't really see what's going on in here but basically you have a chamber right here a chamber right here a chamber right here and a chamber right here as a result of fluid filling any one of those chambers this rod is going to move and that rod moving that output is going to move and manipulate the upper controls eventually manipulating the rotors now here we go what you're going to find out is this mechanism actually has a built-in redundancy too why because this mechanism can get caught so what you have inside of here is a sleeve that will still move in response to your control inputs and guess what you don't see feel or know anything on the flight controls it flies just like it normally would now if that is happening is it important for us to know sure it is so what you have associated with each one of the boost portions you have what's called a jam indicator in addition to still manipulating that piston just like it's supposed to in addition to that fluid is going to be allowed to come in here and pop this jam indicator telling us that we have a problem other than that you wouldn't see or feel anything on the flight controls any questions any questions about your boost portion is it a, is it a pressure differential that pops that or is it Nope. When you say fluid. fluid is going to be allowed as a result of that sleeve moving it's going to be allowed to go through a series of chambers that will literally go in there and pop that button otherwise fluid can't get in that portion because that sleeve blocks the port going up to it, it. we'll make it simple for you okay that sleeve is inside of here okay if that sleeve moves now what's going to be allowed to happen is fluid 
is going to be allowed to go in through this chamber mechanism right here. If that sleeve doesn't move, that fluid just goes this way. It doesn't go this way. So as a result of that sleeve moving inside of here, now there's two more slits right here, allowing fluid to go into this chamber right here, resulting in that jam indicator popping. Good question. Anything else? Okay, now. So there's the two systems. We already talked about that. There's that jam indicator we just talked about for the boost portion. Again, the boost portion provides hydraulic assist and prevents control feedback, which we have already pretty much covered. The pilot control valve, separate housing, prevents fluid transfer between the two systems. In other words, the number one flight control hydraulic fluid doesn't mix with the number two and vice versa. That fluid cannot mix based on the way the ch chambers are designed. Now we're going to talk about the extensible link portion. The extensible link portion belongs to the advanced flight control computers. Gentlemen, the extensible link portion of the ILCAs, the integrated lower control actuators, belongs to the ASCS. The number one ASCS controls the top extensible link. The number two ASCS controls the number two or the bottom extensible link. Number one flight control hydraulics, number two flight control hydraulics. Why? Because ultimately the computers are still manipulating what? Hydraulic fluid. Can those computers manipulate 2,500 pounds worth of rotor system? Nope. So they need hydraulic assist too. So what are the computers doing? The computers are manipulating hydraulic fluid too. Any questions about that? Now, what's going to happen, the first thing we need to know is how many extensible link portions do we have? Three. How many ilkas did we say we had? Four. Four. But we only have three il extensible link portions. Why? Because the thrust does not have one. Now, does the thrust axis get manipulated by the AFCS? Yes. Where? Dash. No. The CCDA, the cockpit control driver actuator. Remember, the dash is in the long longitudinal axis or the pitch axis of the aircraft. Okay, it manipulates it by the CCDA, cockpit control driver actuator. Okay, any questions about that? Now, as a result of the advanced flight control computers manipulating the flight controls, you don't see them and you don't feel them. As a result of the AFCS manipulating those extensible link portions of the ILCA, you don't see them, you don't feel them. Because the only thing that gets manipulated, any action that happens at the ILCA, the only thing that's going to be manipulated is the output shaft. Which is why, once you understand how the ILCA works, I can take this ILCA and give it to anybody. And you can identify the top or number one system versus the bottom or number two system. Because I know that my pilot inputs come in from the bottom. So all I have to do is find, oh, here's my pilot control rod. Okay, so this has to be my bottom. And then I also know that the AFCS only manipulates what portion of the ILCA, the integrated lower control actuator? Output. So here's my output. How do I know? Here we go. Here's the extensible link portion. Good. Any questions about that? 
Now, when we look at it, what you're going to find out is again, the A of CS is only manipulating what? Hydraulic fluid. So here's what it's going to look like, gentlemen. Uh, well, we'll actually show it to you here in just a second. Okay. Linear variable differential transducers. Now, everybody makes this hard. Inside of here, inside of here, and inside of here is your LVDT, linear variable differential transducer. For the purpose of what? And I always refer back to something that we're all familiar with. You're all leaders in the United States Army or in the Army, right? Or in the Air Force, right? Your aircraft's in the Air Force. Okay, but we're all leaders in this room. Agreed? Now, if I told somebody junior to me to do something, one of two things has to happen. Agreed? Either one, I've got to go follow up and say, did you do what I told you? And then they have to say yes or no, which is really not desired. Or, in this case, Jeff has to come back and say, Tom, I did what you asked me to do. Three bags full, right? Well, the same process is happening. If the computer is saying, extensible link, move, the computer needs something to come back and say, I've moved. And that comes in the form of a LVDT, linear variable differential transducer. And quite simply, all it is, is a mechanism Okay, I think Alrighty. Okay, all it is is a mechanism, and John took the good one because we're cutting up a lot of pieces and parts while he's up at Fort Campbell. And what happens is this is connected to a control rod inside, inside of here. And what happens as a result of that movement, this rod is going to push in and out of a mechanism, and all it's doing is creating a variable resistance signal. The farther it's in, the more resistance. The farther it's out, the less resistance. And therefore, that's interpreted as an amount of movement. So the LVDTs, the Linear Variable Differential Transducers, quite simply do nothing more than saying, you told me to move, I moved. But now, here's what you have to keep in track. We actually have three Linear Variable Differential Transducers per extensible link portion. Why do I stress expense extensible link portions? How many extensible link portions do we have? Three. three. So why do we have three? You got one for the number one AFCS. You got one for the number two AFCS. But here's what you have to keep in mind. The two computers don't talk to each other. So now, the number one computer sold the number one system to move. The number one system said whether or not it moved. The number two system did the same thing. But now we need a method of knowing what? Sum. The sum of them. And what you have is what's called the summing link. Here's the summing link. Okay, this link is going to move as a result of both systems moving it. And connected to it is the summing LVDT, linear variable differential transducer. But you'll notice it has two cannon plugs. Why two cannon plugs? Exactly. Saying both AFCSs, this is how much I moved. Now we'll talk in more detail about this under AFCS too. Any questions about that? 
Dual AFCS operations, extensible links provide 100% of the required input. Single AFCS operation, extensible link provides 200% total required control inputs based on a fixed input. What are we talking about, gentlemen? We're talking about the fact that if I fly single AFCS, what are you going to see, feel, and know on the aircraft? And the answer is zip, zilch, nada, and nothing. The aircraft's going to fly just fine. Why? Because what we're going to talk about is that in the case of a single AFCS, it's going to use a term called three-quarter gain. Anybody read that? And it gets very, very aggravated. Because if I read three-quarter gain, what's my mindset, gentlemen? If I see three-quarter gain or 0.75 gain, what is my mindset? So that's the value of ELG. Okay, what? A reduction in performance or a reduction in capability, right? Is there a reduction in capability? No. So here's what's going to happen. Number one computer controls that one. Number two computer controls that one. Number one computer, and I use one half. Why do I use one half? Because the dash 10 says that each one of those systems will provide for half of the required input. So I use one half. So here we go, one half down. If that's half the movement, what does this one have to do? It has to come down one half. Good? Where did the one half come from? I made it up. It has to go up. No, sir. It has to come down. Because what I want that length to do, what I want that length to do is to come down all together. Now, we have a self LVDT linear variable differential. Self LVDT. Here we go again. Each one of the systems knows connected to the summing link is the summing LVDT. Two cannon plugs, one going to the number one, one going to the number two. We good so far? That's how the system works. Now, here we go, gentlemen. We're going to play devil's advocate. This system doesn't do its job. Now what's going to happen is what? We're going to get a look that looks like that, which is now going to put that control rod right there, giving you the understanding exactly of what we just said, right? Three-quarter gain, right? Wrong. Because that's not where it's going to stop. Because what's going to happen is this summing link is going to say what? The required inputs is not there. So now what's going to happen is now this becomes my fixed point. It becomes my pivot point. And what's going to happen now is this other system is going to come down, now resulting in the 100% 
required input output. Now, why does the three-quarter gain? What is the three-quarter gain? It's an electrical term. If you're an electrical engineer or electrical knowledge, gain means something to you, which means quite simply what? It slows down a little bit. But as slow as it goes, it's still faster than you would ever realize. Because what happens is, why does it slow down? Because the computer said, move. Right? And they moved. But they didn't move enough. So now what has to happen is once they determine they didn't move enough, they need to send an additional signal. So that slows it down. Hence, gain. Okay? But reality is, you don't need the term gain anywhere near our operator's manual. All you need to know is that a single AFCS will fly this aircraft just fine. Questions? Okay. And then this is just going to show you how fluid's going to come in. And what's going to happen is one portion of that fluid is going to unlock a mechanism allowing for this control rod to move. Okay? What you have on here is an electrohydro servo. Why electrohydro servo? Because it's going to send out an electrical signal that now has to be converted into a what? hydraulic movement. And quite simply, all it is inside of there is a pin. Here's a magnet. If I magnetize it and I suck it this way, then fluid's going to go one way. If I magnetize it and suck it the other way, then fluid's going to go another way. And inside of here is a locking mechanism the fluid also has to pull out to allow that movement to occur. But now what happens is if that hydraulic fluid goes away, that pin's going to lock back into place, but it's also going to take this rod to a known nominal length for the purpose of what? Giving that other system the ability to compensate for a lack of movement right here. If it just stopped any old place, then it may not be able to throw enough to compensate for the other system. But because the pin takes it to a known nominal length or a known location, then the other system can compensate for it. Any questions about that? Okay, now. Right here are what's called authority covers. Okay? Those authority covers would be right here. Can everybody see that? And what you're going to notice about these authority covers are their different sizes based on the axis that they're in so that it knows where to take that nominal length and also it will limit the amount, depending on which axis that that's in, how much movement is allowed to occur at that extensible length portion of the OCA. Questions? Okay, now, what you're going to find out is here are the authority covers. We're passing them around, and they are marked which axis they belong to. So you can put them side by side and say, okay, this is the biggest one. Oh, that belongs to the pitch and so on, just in case you ever want to know. We never could do that before. We just got those. Any questions about that? Now, the upper dew boost actuators. When we talk about the upper dew boost actuators, the upper dew boost actuators are one, going to be operated by 3,000 psi of hydraulic pressure. What did we say the ILCAs operate off of? 1,500. 
Okay. Why? Because all of all that's happening here at this ILCA, the integrated lower control actuator, is it's going to be moving another series of connecting rods to connect to the upper dew boost actuator. Here is one piston of our upper dew boost actuators. This is one piston. We have two pistons and they would be bolted side by side. Why is that important to understand? Because just like the redundancy in there, this needs to be redundant too, doesn't it? So what happens is I have one piston that's owned and operated by the number one flight control hydraulic. The other piston's owned and operated by the number two and they're connected up at the top. If 3,000 PSI in the number one system says go up and there's nothing right here, what's going to be happening? The whole thing's going to go up. And so that's where the redundancy happens. Now watch this. Just like before, the only thing that's going to happen is you move this control rod. As a result of moving that control rod, you're going to pull this pin right here. Inside of there, you have this mechanism You have this mechanism right there. So what happens is this whole arm would be inside of here. As a result of that connecting rod going up or down, again, it's going to move this rod, which is going to move hydraulic fluid, telling that hydraulic fluid to go down through these different holes to either fill the bottom chamber, pushing up on the piston, or filling the top chamber, pushing down on the piston causing that hydraulic movement, causing the swash plate now to move, which is going to result in the pitch angle of attack on the rotor blades to change. Questions? Now, guess what? Just like this system had, it has a redundancy. If this rod becomes jammed in here, here's that sleeve. That sleeve will, remove, will move as a result of this control rod being stuck in there. Guess what's going to happen right here? It's going to move just like it did before. The only thing that's going to happen now is fluid is also going to come into this chamber right here and pop another jam indicator. Telling you what? Telling you that you're moving that sleeve in there. Any questions about that? Two together makes it pivoting or swiveling. Yes, sir. Okay. You're tracking. Anything else? So how many upper do boost actuators do we have? We have four. One piston belongs to the number one flight control hydraulic. One piston belongs to the number two. And as it already was said, they're labeled pivoting and swiveling. And we'll talk more about that under rotor. Okay. You have a pivoting and swiveling that makes the forward rotor system. You have a pivoting and swiveling that makes up the aft rotor system. There's the jam indicators that we were just talking about. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the dash. And this will be the final thing that we talk about. The dash is going to be covered very, very extensively under AFCS. The top motor belongs to the number one AFCS. The bottom number motor belongs to the number two AFCS. The dash is going to provide for three features, gentlemen. It's going to provide for three features. Airspeed hold above 40 knots. Pitch attitude hold below 40 knots. And positive stick gradient. Now one of the first things that everybody asks is what? What in the heck is positive stick gradient? Keeping in mind, positive stick gradient is nothing more than quite simply is in any other aircraft I was flying, if I put in forward cyclic, what I would have to do is I would have to put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. Now listen, gentlemen, I know your IPs told you that no, you should have been able to find a spot and leave it there. How many people actually found that spot? Okay. The only thing that really happened 
is the movements became so slight that nobody could really notice them. Okay? In this aircraft, you can put a one inch stick position, leave it, and this aircraft will maintain 100 knots all doggone day. All doggone day. But what do you think the dash is doing to accomplish that? Out in, out in, out in, out in. But why? Because it can't find that so called sweet spot any better than you can. It's always going to be correcting for forces acting on the aircraft too to maintain that airspeed. And we'll get more into this under AFCS. Questions?